Um, good afternoon. I'm Martin. I'm actually based here at Charles University, which is down there under the hill. <coughs> it wasn't a long trip for me. Um, I'm one of the maintainers of the GeoPandas project. Uh, before I start, can I ask quickly who knows GeoPandas at least a little bit? Okay, most of you. That's good. That's good. Uh, I can be brief in my introductions. Should I? Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about GeoPandas 1.0, which is a release we have uh, finished after a long, long time. And I'm going to talk what has changed and what's coming after that. So the, slide, the title of the talk is GeoPandas 1.0 and beyond. Uh, the whole story starts quite a while ago at a conference very similar to this one uh, at SciPy 2013, uh, which was in Texas, I believe. And it started uh, during um, like a birds of feather session. People who were dealing with spatial data were just sat together and were kind of figuring out what to do next. And someone asked, asked a question at the time. Uh, can we somehow link geometries to pandas objects? Would it kind of work? And during the evening and the night and the day, day, day after, they actually hacked the very first version of GeoPandas. And a year later, at SciPy 2014, uh, Kelsey Jordal, who is the main father of the GeoPandas project, uh, actually presented back at SciPy uh, GeoPandas 0.1, the very first release. It took them a, a whole year to actually finish the, time, the, the work, to make it into something which is usable. And it's very interesting to see this uh, presentation, which is roughly 10 years old, because the way how Kelsey talks about GeoPandas and how it aims to simplify working with spatial data within the pandas ecosystem and all these things, I could essentially use exactly the same words today, which is, which is really nice to, to see that even with Kelsey's departure from the project a few years after SciPy 2014, we still kind of managed to do exactly what he envisaged uh, in the very beginning. But I will do a brief introduction about GeoPandas is. As you can guess probably from the name, it has something to do with pandas. And uh, GeoPandas essentially provides uh, subclasses of pandas objects, of uh, pandas series into a GeoPandas geo series, and pandas data frame into a GeoPandas geo data frame. Uh, the reason why we have subclasses and not uh, extensions of any other sort, accessors, uh, is essentially the age of the project. Back then, it was actually even complicated to subclass uh, Pandas objects. There was a lot of uh, coordination between, between developers on the Pandas side to ensure that we can actually do this. And since then, it stayed as, as, as it is. Uh, but what it means, GeoSeries and GeoDataFrame? GeoSeries is a simple. Uh, it's a series which contains geometries and it has geometric D-type, and all the geometric methods we define in GeoPandas are tied to a GeoSeries. GeoDataFrame is a pandas data frame which contains at least one GeoSeries, uh, of which one is usually marked as active GeoSeries. Uh, so uh, when you apply a geometric operation on the whole data frame, it's applied to the active geometry column. If you are familiar with GIS, it kind of very similar, similar logic, but GeoPandas had a bit more flexibility. Uh, in practice, it looks like this. If you open geospatial data, uh, which is a tabular data set with uh, usually one uh, geometry column, GeoPandas loads it in this way. It looks exactly like a uh, pandas data frame would look like. It just has that very specific column. And GeoPandas understands what the column means and understands how to work with that. Which means that we can, for, a, for example, measure areas of polygons. We can get the uh, their geometric centroids. We can measure distances. We can do a lot of uh, things related to uh, geometric 
objects, we can plot them on the map, be it static with Matplotlib or interactive uh, through Folium into the uh, JavaScript library called Leaflet. And all this support is built in GeoPandas. It's gradually kind of appeared over the years and uh, it took a while. So as I mentioned, we started at uh, SciPy 2013. I wasn't part of the team back then. Um, actually, no one who is part of the team right now was part of the team back then. It kind of has switched completely. But we started with a workshop and then the first release in 2014. Uh, in 2016, uh, Kelsey Jordal, I think, was changing uh, his, his jobs, uh, and uh, Joris van den Bosch became the lead maintainer of the project. He is still uh, one of the maintainers of the project until today. And he's one of the kind of key persons within the geospatial ecosystem, covering a lot of different things. And he's also one of the maintainers of Pandas. Uh, in 2017, uh, there were discussions how to make this faster, right? Uh, at the time, uh, all geometries were shapely objects, and each geometry was its own shapely object, and if you wanted to measure array of all of them, you had to essentially do a for loop. We did it internally, but it was a for loop, calling the underlying uh, C++ library called Geos one geometry at a time. And that was inefficient. So a couple of people started uh, figuring out whether we can rewrite this in Cython, we can do, whether we can do vectorized interface. And that essentially led to this tag in the GeoPandas history, which is um, how many, seven years ago, we actually tagged 1.0 dev version, and it took us a long time to actually get rid of the death part of the tag. Uh, but the reason for this was to allow people to play with this site and branch. But in the end, it kind of all turned out completely differently. And the whole work on vectorization was kind of split apart from GeoPandas. And uh, over the years, it um, kind of materialized in a package called PyGeos, which was then merged back to Shapely. It was kind of a long story. Uh, but right now we have a new version of Shapely, Shapely 2.0, which essentially contains vectorized interface to Geos. And there is no longer a need for a Python for loop if we want to get area of all geometries, for example. Uh, in 2019, uh, we have kind of refactored the way how we uh, dealt with the geometries into Pandas extension array because that became possible at the time. And over the years, we kind of added a lot of uh, minor or major uh, changes. Uh, a big thing for us was the year 2020 when the project got affiliation with Nanfocus and we were able to ask for at least some small funding and we are able to receive uh, donations right now and, and use them in some way to support the project. But uh, that doesn't change the fact that the whole project is still uh, maintained by volunteers. And some of us are able to work on it as, as part of their jobs, kind of, uh, if we decide that it's a good thing to do and we don't ask anyone. Uh, version point eight uh, included the PyGeos, which is the vectorized, um, engine, the original vectorized engine for, for, for geometries, uh, and it allowed significant speedups. It was still optional. We had to support different engines. It was a bit complicated internally. Um, a few years ago, we included interactive visualization of data. Uh, and then we included another library, uh, which is another interface to another C++ library called the GDAL, which uh, takes care of reading and writing uh, specialized geospatial file formats. Again, we tried to ensure that we can do this in a vectorized way, and PyAgrio became supported uh, two years ago, and right now it's gonna be fully embraced within GeoPandas. And last year we got uh, a sponsored level uh, at, at Nampokus, which actually allows us a bit more uh, 
it gives us potential to actually uh, raise money. We, we never managed to since we even started to looking into that, but we have the infrastructure. So if you want to donate something to, to Japan, just you can. Right now we have uh, 1.0 release. I think it's two weeks ago. Um, it took a long time, and some stuff has changed. It's the major release. It's the first major release. Uh, as it comes with major releases, some uh, heartbreaking changes are happening. We try to minimize them, so there's not a lot of those, but some stuff happened. Uh, to, to mention a few, uh, when you were doing spatial join between two geometries, uh, we have never preserved the name, index name of the one on the right, kind of, the one you're joining to, to, to your uh, data frame. Right now we're doing that, which unintentionally breaks some downstream code, and, but there wasn't a good way of, of, of going around it. Uh, and we have tried to ensure that GeoPandas has uh, easier dependency tree. So some packages which can be more challenging to install or build, for example, on Windows, are no longer required. And we are allowing kind of using GeoPandas even outside of the geospatial context within some spatial operations. We know that people are using it for uh, analysis of some microscopic data where the geo context kind of doesn't really matter. So they don't need the geo libraries. Uh, we now require Shapely 2.0 and uh, we have switched the default engine for reading and writing files from Fiona, which was there since 2013, to Pyagria, which is much faster. Uh, it's fully maintained by the GeoPandas team, unlike Fiona, which is kind of external project and is designed to be used with, uh, with GeoPandas. Uh, but it occasionally leads to slight differences in how the files are read. This is the key dependency tree of GeoPandas. Uh, the first, or the, the, like the middle row, uh, covers Python packages. So we have obviously Pandas, we have Shapely, which provides geometries, we have Fiona and Pyogria providing the uh, to link to read and write files, and we have PyProch, which provides us uh, to link to understand where exactly on, on Earth the geometries are. Uh, but both Shapely, PyGrio, and PyProch uh, are actually wrappers to C++ libraries, GDAL, Geos, and Proch, and especially with GDAL, it can be a bit tricky to ensure that it's all compiled correctly and it's all working correctly. So these two are now optional. We still obviously require geos because geopandas without geometries is just pandas. We have a lot of new stuff coming or arrived. Uh, there was a big project which was funded by Nafocus, which we thank for, uh, for to, to get the API parity with Shapely, which means that every single function from Shapely is now available directly in GeoPandas as methods. And you, in most cases, don't need to leave the GeoPandas namespace to do essentially any, uh, any supported operation. Uh, I will get to reasoning why this is important a bit later when talking about the future plans. Uh, we have new, very powerful unions. So if you are joining geometries together, uh, that operation can take quite some time, especially if you have a lot of geometries. Uh, if you know that those uh, geometries are forming a spatial polygonal coverage, which means that they are uh, like, let's say, state boundaries. Uh, you know, one polygon lies next to each other. There is no in intersections, overlaps, or anything of this sort. You can use the new coverage union methods and the performance will be about, I don't know, eight to 15 times faster than it was before, depending on the, on the use case. And this is exposed through all the relevant uh, methods where any uh, union is happening. Uh, until GeoPandas 1.0, you were able to uh, join two sets of geometries, spatially based on intersection, 
uh, but whether one is within another, whether they are overlapping, whether they are touching, but there has to had to be some uh, relationship where coordinates were actually at the same place. Uh, right now, that changes, and we have included a new spatial predicate called D within, which stands for distance within, and we're able to join points which are, for example, within 100 meters from from from, from the other points. There's no need to do a manual buffer of 100 and then do the intersection join. You can do go directly, and it's going to be much faster than using kind of a more complicated route, which was necessary before. The same, obviously, is exposed within the underlying spatial index if you want to work with spatial index yourself and don't want to rely on spatial join. Uh, we spent quite some time on uh, proper support of uh, GeoParquet and GeoArrow. For those of you who don't know what that is, uh, GeoArrow is an in-memory specific layout for representation of geometries. And GeoParquet is a way how to store GeoArrow or any arrow table uh, efficiently into a Parquet file. And GeoParquet is a specification of how to do that with spatial data, how to do projections, how to encode geometries. And it has a new version 1.1, which I'm not actually sure if it actually came out already, but we already support it. Uh, which allows us to write a covering bounding box into the file, uh, allowing extremely fast uh, spatial filtering on read, so we can read ver very small subset of your data very quickly without touching anything else in the, in, in, in the file. And we can finally use GeoArrow as encoding of geometries within the Parquet file, because until GeoParquet 1.1, 1 1.0 uh, specification, it was only well-known binary. So it was a binary blob for each geometry, which wasn't very efficient. We have removed a module called datasets. It was there for illustrative purposes. We've used it in documentation. And everyone, a lot of people are using it in their teaching materials, but they were a bit troublesome. Uh, we have a replacement that's called GeoDatasets. It works very similarly. Some data are there, some data are not. Uh, but importantly, there are no contested political boundaries in the whole GeoDatasets project. Because there were contested political boundaries in the datasets module of GeoPandas. The datasets were there since 2014. It uh, used uh, geometries from the Nat Natural Earth project. but there were issues like this. Natural Earth has their own definition of uh, how to deal with contested political boundaries. And it just doesn't uh, end well. At some point, uh, there was a lot of anger on Twitter about the fact that Natural Earth data were showing Crimea as part of Russia, not part of Ukraine. We quickly fixed that and quickly decided, OK, we don't want to uh, deal with any of these issues. GeoPandas is a software project, not a data project. We don't want to deal with political issues. So GeoPandas data sets are gone. And I know that it broke a lot of tutorials, a lot of code on Stack Overflow. I'm sorry for that, but we just had to do this. There were some deprecations, obviously, as part of the 1.0, which were an announced two versions, three versions, or even, I think, 11 versions ago. <laughs> um, so I can just quickly skip those. So is it any faster these days? Kind of depends which versions are we comparing. Uh, if you were using the latest uh, Shapely and Pyogria optionally before, it's not faster than it, that point fourteen was. But it is faster if we kind of take the whole milestone of the work which was targeted for 1.0 and compare it to what, what, what happened before. So right now we do require Shapely 2.0 before you were able to use the older Shapely 1.8 and you can see for yourself how faster the new implementation actually is, depending on the geometries, 
depending on the use case and, and operation, but it can easily be 80 times even, even more faster than the original one. That obviously also translates into spatial joins, which are slightly refactored, so it's even faster kind of internally. Uh, reading files with Biogrio is way faster than it was with Fiona, and it's more memory efficient. Again, depends on the file type, and depends on the complexity of geometries. Uh, but there's also one thing which is not on slides. Uh, we optionally right now uh, allow using Arrow uh, to ship the data from GDEL onto GeoPandas, which uh, cuts these times to about uh, half again. But for some reason, we weren't able to do that by default yet. So what's coming next after GeoPandas 1.0? Uh, a lot of stuff is happening on the side of Geos and Shapely, and we're hoping to get them in the, into GeoPandas soon. Uh, a big thing is probably gonna be coverage simplification, because right now if you, if you have uh, geometries and you simplify them, they are simplified one by one. So uh, states of Africa will look like this uh, once you simplify them. But what we want is something like this. And the image on the right is actually coming from a branch of Shapely, which allows uh, coverage simplification. Obviously, we hope to have some coverage validation for all the coverage-based uh, operations. And uh, it's possible, uh, probably quite likely, that uh, in future we will also have support of curved, curved geometry types within Shapely and within GeoPandas. So stuff like uh, curved polygons, uh, circular strings, will make their way into, into GeoPandas for some people who might actually need those. Big thing, hopefully, is uh, incoming spherical geometry engine. So right now, GeoPandas uh, re requires geos, which can do spatial operations only on a plane. It assumes that everything is flat. The world is flat. You somehow have to project it into a flat space. Uh, not every operation, not every analysis, especially if you're working with the global scale, can be done using geos. Uh, so uh, we will provide support for uh, package called Spherely, which uses Google's S2 library instead of geos, which exactly provides support of uh, spherical geometries. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we uh, wanted to have the functionality of Shapely exposed as methods on GeoPandas uh, level. Because if we are relying on GeoPandas methods, GeoPandas itself can automatically decide whether we should use uh, Spherely or Shapely. If you have your geometries as spherical geometries of Spherely objects and you apply Shapely function, obviously it's gonna error, right? And if, but if you are relying on uh, GeoPandas methods, GeoPandas can do these decisions for you and just use whatever is most, most suitable for your use case. Uh, we're also hoping to provide a bit more support of GeoArrow. Uh, I think that the next talk in this, in this room will talk a bit more about what Arrow is, so uh, if you're interested overall what Arrow is, just, just stay here. Um, this is probably not gonna be useful for majority of, of users, but if you are dealing with very large data, uh, you may want to delay conversion of geometries when reading GeoParquet file into Shapely until you actually need it, or in some cases you may not need it at all. Uh, we're hoping that in coming years, that's probably like four to five, uh, we may be able to replace Shapely optionally with a uh, Rust implementation of uh, geospatial um, operations within the GeoArrow RS uh, package, which should provide, hopefully, some performance boost and multi-threading uh, Geos is not able to provide right now, but this is kind of very open. It may happen, it may not. Uh, we're trying to do a lot of stuff on scaling within the Dask GeoPandas project, which is kind of lagging behind, so we want to get the parity and full compatibility with Dask Expression Engine. 
and interactive mapping based on data shader. All of these have kind of different branches somewhere, but it's not finished and tested. And um, um, I'm obviously standing here as one of the maintainers of the project, but we couldn't do the whole project without a vast number of contributors. We counted over 200 contributors, uh, code contributors over the years. There are hundreds more who are um, publishing, uh, just reporting bugs, or writing tutorials, and everything else. So we thank them all, and we thank them Focus for support, and I thank uh, Europe Python for space here. And I think we have four minutes for questions, if you have some. Thank you.